want to say we still have folks that aren't following the recommendations, and that ultimately hurts all of us. I'm about to do the update today of new cases, but I want to say without identifying which one, we have a positive case today from someone who attended a coronavirus party. And this is the part uh, where I, the person that tell everybody to be calm, have to remain calm myself. Because anyone who goes to something like this may think that they are indestructible, but it's someone else's loved one that they are going to hurt. We are battling for the health and even the lives of our parents and our grandparents. And don't be so callous as to intentionally go to something and expose yourself to something that can kill other people. We ought to be much better than that. Got to tell you, I didn't know that there was such a thing as a coronavirus party. Producer Mark, had you had you heard about this? No, but nothing shocks me anymore. Uh, turns out that some of the spring breakers who were down in Florida who were like, yeah, man, I can't get coronavirus. If I do, it's like no big deal, man. Uh, some of them, the ones that there's a pretty famous photo now of them doing. I don't I don't know if they're taking shots off the small of each other's backs. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a shot train or something like a body shot. Yeah, like they're taking body shots, but off the like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's a family show, but they're out in public I mean, they're clothed. But I, I just anyway, turns out one of them. I, I don't know which one I don't think they're identifying, but one of them has uh, come down with uh, COVID-19 now. So even on spring break where it's warm and everyone was drinking and partying. Yeah, the, you can still. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of things you can catch, but uh, they caught COVID-19. And that's not a surprise to anybody that was looking at this saying, what are you guys doing down there? And they shut down the beaches. Uh, it's kind of a shame that they shut, they shut things down when there are some people who comply and others who don't. Obviously, taking body shots is not complying. Uh, but there are some activities that are, you know, a little bit more in the, is this really, like tennis is shut down now in D.C., you're more than six feet away from somebody playing tennis against them. I don't know. That seems to me a little, a little tough. Basketball shut down because you're going to have close physical contact playing basketball. That's here in New York City. So there are only some sports, some activities that you're uh, approved to do right now. And it turns out that in, in the gym in my building, everybody did return the equipment that they took, which is kind of funny to me because I thought about borrowing that equipment too because I'm just, man, quarantine bod is going to hit the Buckster hard. I'm going to show up here in, you know, a couple of months, like 20 or 30 pounds heavier with a shaved head because I'm just going to get so sick. I can't do anything about the massive swoop. You know, I know these are dumb things. I've got friends who are complaining that they can't. You know, I know ladies who say they can't get their nails done. And that's, you know, annoying. I mean, these are these are the little petty things that we all know don't matter. We're not really complaining about it. But if we're going to have a little fun with our circumstance now in quarantine, you know, this is the stuff that you just got to you got to roll with somehow. Uh, you got to find a way to take care of yourself and in, in, in uh, new with new challenges. Um, I will say that I'm trying to keep my apartment as clean as I possibly can, recognizing that. But I, you spend so much time in it. I feel like it's easier for things to, to pile up and get dirty. Plus, I got a little dog running around here, although she's actually quite clean. Um I'm much messier. The human being is much messier than the canine in this in this context. But I don't have the luxury that, say, producer Mark has where he's able to just uh, keep it buzzed. I do have clippers, though, for the beard. So maybe maybe I just try. What do I mark? Do I, if I put on the highest whatever it is, like, a, you know, probably an inch or an inch and a half uh, guard on the clippers and I just went after it, I probably could. My, my parents would, would, you know, people would be like, what are you thinking? Mm. But I, I probably could uh, shave it down, right? Shave the head down if I not, not shave it all the way, but like give like a like a crew cut, like a trim. Yeah. I mean, you could. I don't know. It do sounds it, like it, a terrible is, idea, but you could. I mean, this is a terrible idea. But now I'm thinking it's like, what if I live stream this <laughs> just to entertain people? I mean, it would be great content. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, it would be so. Would we have to change all the headshots? Like, how would that work? I know I'd look so ridiculous, but I I can't look. You can't. Get, there's no barber shops open. You can't get a haircut right now. It is. You not, don't go to a barber shop. You go to a salon. I do not go to uh, a yeah, salon. I don't sir. believe you. Excuse me, sir. I will have you. It's know. more salon than barber shop. I'm sure. This is a. This is false. 
This is fun. how much do you pay for a haircut, Buck? Fifty bucks. Yeah, that's that's a salon. If you yeah. really want to know, actually, I go to a. Uh, let's see if pro- a producer Nick has thoughts on this too. What's he What's he telling me? Uh, I go to a hair and uh, makeup guy from the uh, TV news business who can do it. Who does it right there while the news anchors are getting ready? That's actually so. I got kind of a hookup with that, but the studios are all shut down, so I can't do that anymore. So I technically don't even really. I used to go to a barber though, a very well known barber on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I will have you know. Where none other than sure. Mr. Donald Trump used to get his hair cut. So, uh, he definitely goes to a salon. Um, I don't know who. I, I'd be curious hmm. to know who. And I, look, I know this is, folks, I, this is intentionally frivolous talk because we can't just wallow in the, in the you know, mounting tension and, and for some near despair right now. We've got to think about other things, too, sometimes. Yeah, I don't know. You're going to have a quarantine cut, quarantine cut buck at some point. I do think the beard going, uh, and for a lot of you, write in. Tell me what you're doing. I mean, I, I want to know what the folks are up to out there. Let me know if you're going to be doing your own haircut, if you're planning on making any changes. Um, I also, I shared on Instagram, my, I made seared scallops in a browned butter herb sauce. I used chive. I probably should have used uh, tarragon. Tarragon's very good with the, uh, I, I like tarragon with seafood. Also, you know, producer Mark, what's your favorite aromatic or herb? I don't say I have one, Buck. Hmm. Who has a well, favorite have herb? Let's work on that. For red meat, I'm a rosemary guy, so I think a little bit of, of, of finely chopped rosemary adds a very nice little little oomph to a red meat. But well, what what are the producer Mark tips for staying staying happy, healthy, and sane in quarantine? What what do you bring? Bring us into the a day in the life of producer Mark out in NJ, Ugh. making sure that he stays safe and sound. I've gotten into a bit of a routine, and I hate it. Like, I'm waking up later than I normally would because I don't have to commute anywhere. So what's the point of getting up at the crack of dawn like I normally do? Uh, then I wait for you to finally be ready after yes. I get all the cuts. Yeah. That takes then I time. do the show. That does take a lot of time. Then I do the show, uh, watch some TV, maybe have some lunch, play some video games. My wife will get home, make some dinner, go to bed. What is what is Mrs. Mark? What does Mrs. Mark do? Uh, she uh, manages an imaging center, which is staying open during all of this. Right, I thought she's medical. She's in the medical provider yeah, community. She is. What she What she's saying about what her colleagues and folks that she's you know doctors' offices and stuff. What, what I'm just wondering, does she have any kind of atmospherics about what's going on? Because we're right here in New York City. I mean, luckily she isn't dealing with patients that are necessarily infected, but they are screening everybody before they come in. You know, since radiology is fairly important, if somebody needs, you know, a CAT scan or something, they have to stay open. But if they have a fever or anything like that, they have to go wait in their car. Then they'll get screened. It's a whole process that they're doing right now. And she has to wear a mask and gloves and all that stuff all day. So it's definitely interesting times for anyone in healthcare. And I mean, I am thankful she's not clinical right now. Not that I wouldn't want her to be if she wanted to be. But I, I mean, I just my heart goes out to all those people right now that are are on the front lines and my, my sister-in-law yeah. included. I know a lot of nurses. I've, I've spoken to, I've spoken to some MDs in the last week um, who, you know, friends of mine, I have a lot of, I have actually a fair number of friends who went to medical school and now they're doctors in practice. And uh, they, they're worried. They're worried because they're, remember it, it's all about exposure to, you know, the, the amount of virus. I mean, this stuff is highly complicated and actually isn't even really understood all that well um, by, by science. Um, but the amount of viral exposure, the duration of viral exposure, all these things can affect not just your whether or not you get infected, but perhaps even the severity of the infection. So, you know, people that are on the front lines as healthcare providers have to be super, super careful, careful about all this stuff. But I said we're going to we're going to enter the the uh, how to stay how to stay safe and sane in quarantine zone of the show instead of, you know, focusing on on what can feel pretty bleak sometimes on the other side. Do you guys, what was the show you guys told me you both like that I'm I'm need to check it out? It was a manifest. Manifest. I'll, what, what, do you think I would like it? I think you would, and I also did you, did you like Breaking Bad? I loved Breaking Bad. Okay, I thought, it was, I thought it might be the best TV show of all time. Yes. So have you seen Ozark? I think uh, it's Jason. I, lo- I like Bateman? Ozark a lot. I think it's yeah. kind of a poor man's Breaking Bad, yeah. but that doesn't mean it's not. Well, a it comes back show. Friday. That's why I'm mentioning it. Mentioning it, the new season comes out. No way, yeah. really. Which is great really? timing. That is good. That is good timing. I'm gonna I'm gonna binge that this weekend for sure. Also, uh, have you you haven't seen the Last Kingdom? The Last Kingdom just came out with I think season four or maybe five. 
um, which is a great a great show about the Viking era era of expansion. So I got that one going. Does producer Mark have a book he's reading right now? Uh, producer Mark should be reading a lot more, but he's not. Hmm. Huh. Well, I was Mark reading the uh, Mitch Rapp series before. Uh... Oh, that's the uh, that's the movie with Tom Cruise in it, right? Yeah, but I read the book. I heard the the, the movie stunk. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, was it pretty good? It is pretty good. Yeah, I'm in the middle. He of it. passed away recently, and I I actually read a number of his books. I don't remember them at all, but I remember liking them. Was Clive Cussler? You know that guy is. He writes not. these adventure kind of like adventure Tom Clancy novels. You know, it's somehow there's always like a Navy SEAL who's traveling to the Sahara Desert or you know undersea, uh, you know, in the Mariana Trench or you know whatever. I mean, there's like all this. These very contrived situations, but uh, I remember reading Clive Cuss. He just passed away, I think maybe a month ago. Um, but I remember reading his books and thinking they're pretty great. Now would be a really good time to dig into some Tom Clancy, some of Michael Crichton's bets. Did you ever read Jurassic Park? I didn't. Uh, that's something I would like to read, though. That's a great book. Like the you'll you will, and the book is better than the movie, which is usually true, right? But you'll appreciate the book even having seen the movie a bunch of times. The book is just way. It's just an elevated level from what you have versus. Um, yeah, but the movie was good, unlike Congo, which is another Michael Crichton book that I would recommend to people who are on quarantine lockdown right now. Congo is a great read. It's cool for, for you know what it is. Um, the movie is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. Have you ever seen the Congo movie? I have not. It's amazing. Mm. People show up. There are killer. There are these killer gorillas that are white with red eyes. So they're like they're like, uh, you know, like polar bear gorillas with red eyes that attack people and, and eat them. Um, and then they try to kill. And then the good guys figure out some laser based on a it's horrible. It's like the worst movie I've ever yeah, seen. Just your description sounds terrible. Yeah. It, and it's like the, the, gra the effects are really cheesy. They have a, a person in a gorilla suit who's speaking using sign language and like a little electronic. Voice. It's horrible. It's oh, like wow. it's actually so bad that I think maybe it's worth watching just so you could see how bad a movie with a pretty big budget can be. Why not just do CGI gorillas like they do in the King Kong No, no, movies? no, it would have been way better. No, this was yeah. like late, this was like 95 or 96. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, so they, they went with like people in gorilla costumes or gorilla suits or whatever, and uh, yeah, it did not, not really work out well. Um, no, Crichton, Crichton books are amazing. Clancy books are amazing. Clive Cussler, um Read Harry never, Potter. I, I never got into uh, who's the who's the the client, the rainmaker, all that like lawyer thriller stuff. Hmm. John Grisham. I never read a John Grisham book. Maybe now is the time. I think my mother liked those back in the day. I don't remember them. You ever read a Stephen King one? No, I don't like horror the, the, that genre. Oh, I mean a, a book. I didn't know if that would be hmm. something you would you would give a try to. But yeah, I'm uh, I got I got plenty of books. But the problem is I have to read so much about coronavirus these days that i feel like reading itself I, I might have to get a playstation 4 sent to me i, I think if we're going to be on lockdown yeah. my i, I my have one already FIFA, my, my call of duty skills will become legendary just give it time can we get to roll call producer mark how about we do that Team, as I've been saying, uh, now more than ever, the connection that we have is just so necessary and so appreciated by me, and I hope you feel the same way. Uh, people are in quarantine. They're getting tired of watching the news all day, and it's nice, to, it's nice to give your eyes a rest. I find that that's really the case, for me at least. And so listening to things, it still allows you to you know, cook dinner, clean up a little bit, do a little bit of uh, admin work, or, you know, I don't know, do a puzzle, whatever you've got going on, listening uh, but not watching can give your eyes a little bit of a rest sometimes. So that's where that's my pitch for podcasting. And if you have a friend who is in quarantine right now, which I mean, a third of the country is in quarantine, um, please do say, hey, you know, just send them. You can send them the Buck Sexton show uh, in a an email, a text message. It's on the Apple Store. It's in the Apple Store, as we know under podcasts, also on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, any of you who have Spotify, you can not just listen to the show yourself, but you can just say, hey, and you share it with a friend of yours. So you you are the one spreading spreading the word about this show, and I greatly, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, I really do appreciate it every day. And uh, it's it's an honor to have 
such an amazing audience uh, as, as I do. Uh, so, all right. With that, we'll get to a roll call, facebook.com slash Buck Sexton, in case you didn't know, or our email address. And I would love, and tell me, you know, write roll call, um, you know, roll call first timer or roll call, uh, I don't know, we'll think of something, something cool for people that are, you know, I guess first timers, that's the word that comes to mind. But I'd love to hear from some people that they haven't written in before and they're just saying, you know, and you can... Producer Mark loves the two or three line roll call messages. Don't think that that's those are not welcome. I mean, the, the slightly longer ones are, are fine, too. Um, but we love, you know, three, four lines. Hey, what's up? Here's my question or here's my thought. You know, Shields High. That's great. We, we, it doesn't have to be a book that you write. It could take you 15 seconds to do this. But we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible. And we're going to get to a lot of this. Also, um, I did another Facebook Live yesterday. Uh, so if you want, that's on Facebook.com slash Buck Sexton. And uh, you can join me on that whenever you like. I'll let you know when we're going to do the next one. It depends on what Tallulah is up for because she can be very, very snooty about doing Facebook Live. She's like, this is not a good angle for me. Where's my hair and makeup people? I'm her hair and makeup people. Uh, Just got to make sure she's clean. All right. Joe. Hey, Buck. Love your show. I've recently added it to my daily podcast regimen. Yesterday, you were thanking people who still show up to work and keep our country moving. As a proud postal employee and a staunch conservative, a rare thing I know, I would like to say no thanks needed. I love my job of 26 years and appreciate the living it has provided. All I would like to ask is when this is over, can people lay off the privatization talk? I think there are things the post office can do in these times of crisis, especially publicly held. During 9-11 and the anthrax crisis, people showed up to their job when we really didn't know how widespread of an attack it was. And today we have people at window counters facing people every day that are at high risk. It seems like when times are good and no crisis, we're an easy punching bag for some. Shields high. Thank you for all you all you do. Joe, a very, a very well made and very appreciated point here. Uh, First of all, I know you're saying no thanks needed, but we are thanking you. And it would really add to everyone's anxiety and feelings of 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 dread if they knew that they weren't able to get mail or if mail was, you know, dramatically delayed and you couldn't get bills, you couldn't get packages. And so people are so used. I do most of my personal shopping. I'd say I do. I'd say I do 90 percent of my personal shopping virtually going into a store. I'm talking about pre pandemic going into a store or something. I rarely do. The only exception is for food and and drug stores if I need something quickly. But other than that, I, I do. I shop on. I get I get my books. I get my clothing. I get, you know, anything I need for the home online. I, I really don't mess around with uh, a lot of in-person stuff. So that means that we need a delivery system. And that's the post office is a big part of that. So thank you, sir, for what you're doing. <laughs> Doug. Hello, Buck. Why are small businesses expected to cover their rental costs when the government shuts them down? It should be the property owners that seek relief from government and not small businesses making rent. Rent should be waived. My town has six landlords that own most of the downtown. Why put the onus on the 75 small businesses? The government has said that these properties are deemed unusable. Doug, it's a, I think it's an entirely fair point. I, mean, I guess they're just taking the prospect of they're just going to get as much money to as many people as they can. But, you know, but I, but I see I know that the property owners in some cases would say, look, we have very large you know, mortgage payments and, and service payments to meet. And if we just if no one gives us rent, we're going to promise too. but the response to that would be, well, then the government should, should step in at that level instead of at the um, small business level. But. Doug, there's no perfect answers. There's no perfect solution. And I'm not saying that as like a, you know, tomato, tomato, you know, who cares? I'm just saying you're right. That would seem to work, too. And that might seem to be a better way to do all of this. Um, but I, I don't have an answer for you as to why the government didn't take that approach. I'm sure they have their reasoning for this. But look, this is a desperate rescue package. This is not something that they've spent years figuring out and. There are clearly, clearly going to be shortcomings. There are shortcomings in it. That, that's baked into this thing. So I, I hear your, uh, I hear you on small businesses and, and the concern that small businesses 
have about making rent and how that's not really seeming to be that reflected in this uh, in this package, Nec- n- n- not as as immediately as perhaps it should. And this is what I keep telling people also. OK, so if you if your business is shut down and they give you some money to make payroll, if your business rent is, I don't know, five thousand dollars a month and you're shut down for the next three months, you go back on you go back on. OK, you've got employees, but where's that fifteen thousand dollars going to come from? Is anybody really the government's going to write checks for all that, too? I mean, you're going to start to get to a point here where is the government the economy or is the government administrating uh, an economy that is the American people? We know that it's supposed to be the second thing, but increasingly it's going to look like the first thing. Uh, Chris, Buck and producer Mark, I've been listening to your show every day on iHeart Podcast for the last several months and share it with anyone who I think will listen. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate that. I just lost my job days ago because the small startup company I was working for is not positioned to make it through this kind of economy. I will be surprised if they still exist in two months. Say a prayer for me and my family, along with everyone else for that matter. I'm one of these folks that my 2018 looked great, but I need something now, and I don't qualify as the aid is being distributed right now. Shields high, brother. Chris, hearts go out to you, man. Uh, I absolutely. This is, this is the circumstance that I've been concerned about. People that work for startups or small companies that are just barely making payroll as it is, they're going to go under because of this. And just because you had a pretty good 2018 doesn't mean that you've got money to cover bills now. Chris, we hear you, man. Just hang in. You and your family, you hang in. Keep uh, keep in touch with all of us. You know, uh, if you can on social, reach out. See if some members of Team Buck are in your area, and they might have some ideas for jobs. You know, leverage this network. I mean, people have got people have gotten jobs because of this show. People have gotten married because of this show. I mean, I, I know these things for a fact. So always think about that. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a community of people who are engaged in an activity every day that you know, brings them up to speed on information and hopefully has some substantial entertainment value. But also other people that listen to this, that's, that's a commonality. It's the same reason why when people listen to this, when people know me from the TV that I do, which I do less now than I used to, I'm mostly focused on radio, but I still do TV sometimes. People know me from TV like, oh, yeah, I know that guy from TV. If they're Team Buck, if they listen to the show every day, they see me, they know I want them to come up and talk to me. They can, Well, now, as I was going to say, they can hug me. These days, we're not really hugging as much, but you guys would all be cleared for a hug if we weren't worried about a pandemic. Uh, but I can always tell the difference. When someone's excited, and they know instinctively, yeah, if I, uh, I see Buck somewhere and I want to go up and talk to him, uh, he'll be, not only are you welcome, I'll be happy. I'll be like, oh, great. What's going on? Talk to me. You know, that that always is that's always the way I feel. And everyone who listens to this radio show knows I'm just bringing that up because, uh, you know, if you find people in your area who listen to this show and you say, hey, can you guys help me out? I just know there's a spirit of of uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, camaraderie, shared patriotism, shared decency. That is so uh, such a, a, a binding a binding agent for this audience that if you reach out to them and say, hey, this is a situation, somebody may really surprise you. Somebody may really be able to help. Um, I know that you know a lot of people listen to this show who are business owners, uh, a lot of people who are very impressive in their fields or just have great Rolodexes might be able to assist you with any number of things. So I'm just putting that out there as an option right now because I know we're all, also because we're all virtual, right? You can't really go out and pound the pavement. You got to pound the keyboard. So see if Team Buck can help out. You know, uh, maybe post in uh, post online to some other people that, you know, who are involved with uh, the Freedom Hut. Duke. Hi, Buck. Uh, From New Zealand here. There are still fewer than 150 cases of the Wuhan virus. As I'm writing this, we will be in lockdown as of midnight tonight. Most of the time, I do not agree with our current government. This time, I believe it is the correct path for our country. Lockdown here is everyone is in isolation and all businesses close except for essential ones. Keep up the good work. Well, Duke, I mean, that just goes to show you New Zealand's on the other side of the world from America, uh, although Kiwis are awesome people. Kiwis, Aussies, I, I, I think my my get along ratio with Kiwis and Auss- Aussies is like plus 90 percent in general. It's, am I going to say it's probably higher than Americans because of all the libs that I have to deal with? I'm just saying Kiwis and Aussies are just like oh, politics, yeah, whatever. You know, they don't really care. So at least the ones that I've met. Um, but anyway, back to what you're saying here, Duke. Uh, yeah, I think the lockdown situation, I, I don't I don't see a way around it, at least in the short term. You've got to at least get your health capacity up 
in all these different countries to try to fight this. India is now increasingly on lockdown. India also has shut us off from our flow of chloroquine pharmaceuticals from them. Folks, you know, for years and years, a lot of people, Trump was one of the biggest voices on this before he was president, warning about we need domestic manufacturing. This is a national security issue. We need access to, we need, you know, domestic energy. We, we can't rely on foreign partners for critical country and life-sustaining needs. And now we are, now we are in the situation that people who were making that case were trying to raise to our attention Sure enough, we got problems, right? Because we don't have manufacturing. Now, look, Bayer, I think down in, I forget where, the, I think it's in one of the Carolinas, but Bayer's ramping up production of chloroquine. There's some information today uh, about, uh, you know, and, and I wanted to tell you about the good news, the good news, and I know that I forgot about that. Um, there's some indication from one study that chloroquine doesn't really do all that much, but it's not an official study, so who knows? You know, we, we just don't know yet, so. We're in a wait and see. We're in wait. The official line right now from me to all of you is we are in wait and see on chloroquine and we are hopeful. That's where we are. But on the good news side of things, the mutation of this virus seems to be pretty slow from what they're seeing, which means that a vaccine would be likely long lasting and effectively permanent if we get one. And also uh, the warm weather is coming and it looks likely that that will that will help dampen the spread of the virus itself. And the Dow surged over 2000 points yesterday, which. Is good, but any stock market move. Stock market moves are really just a reflection of sentiment that day. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody could start to be too happy because the stock market could go down, you know, a thousand points, two thousand points tomorrow, as we all know. But those are all good. Those are all good indicators, good things to look at uh, at this point in time. Jeff writes, "Hey, Buck, Trucker Jeff here. Listen to Monday's podcast. I want to tell you, my wife's a nurse and she's off right now. She had to have a surgery." But she's heard some of the other nurses complaining there that they want to stop going to work because there's not enough protective, uh, prote uh, protective equipment for them. They're scared and mad. Yeah, Jeff, that's I'm hearing some of that, too, where even medical medical providers are saying like, OK, we're willing we're willing to take some degree of risk, but we're not going to show up and treat COVID-19 patients with you know no gloves, no masks and uh, no ve no ventilators to put them on, even if we can figure it out. Right. We, they you need to give them the tools. The same thing. Look, if, if you have somebody in the military, they sign up and you say, all right, you know, go go defeat the Nazis. And they say, all right, where's my rifle? And you say, hey, you know, do the best you can. We're not giving out rifles this time. We don't have any. That's not how we do things here. If we're looking at this as a war analogy with the fight against this virus, we got to give our frontline personnel the tools, the weapons, if you will, against this virus that they need. And that's where I mean, we're, we're seeing American manufacturing right now ramp up. You know, we've seen some of the great names of American industry and commerce, you know, uh, uh, General Motors. For those of you that are big Tesla fans, Tesla says that they're stepping up here. Um, so there's a lot of people that are doing stuff right now to be as as helpful as I can. Ah, Mike, Mike Lindell, my pillow founder. I, I know Mike a little bit. Uh, they're making masks now. My pillow is making masks, send them across the country. So people are really stepping up. Uh, Paul writes, Buck, the article by Professor John uh, Ioannidis was eye-opening. We could probably go on with business as usual with a warning to the more susceptible folks about the risk. Voluntarily testing some people using a random sample method might be a good idea. We may be in a lot of trouble if we don't get back to normal soon. On another note, how can we figure out if a governor has the authority to tell us to stay home? Thank you for your hard work. Paul, this is all very complicated, right? It's all very tough. What, what do we really think the number is for... Not just spread of the disease, but for mortality. Nobody really knows. Nobody really knows. Um, we have a lot of competing estimates. There's a piece in the Wall Street Journal from a couple of other Stanford medical uh, researchers and people that know epidemiology very well. And they're saying that based on the data that we have, it is likely, this is according to a Wall Street Journal editorial, so I, you know, this is an, on the opinion pages, but they're saying that it is probably if you look at all the infections and the number of people that have died from this, it's probably orders of magnitude less lethal than what we were. It already is orders of magnitude less lethal than what we were told in the very beginning, which was three to five percent. That was scaring the crap out of people, rightly so. Um, this is more looking like it's going to be one percent, point five percent, something. Now, remember, point five would be five X the flu. So that's still high. But. 1% is a lot better than 5%, and 0.5% is 
a good bit better than 1%. Uh, got to gotta focus on the math. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's my sense is that we should be prepared in a few weeks. And this is what this is what a lot of uh, libs on the social media are getting angry at me for even suggesting in a few weeks, we should probably try to lessen some of the business and commerce restrictions, but absolutely keep vulnerable populations sequestered home, you know, as safe as possible, get them whatever assistance they need, pay whatever bills need to be paid for them. The government's going to have to break out the checkbook for that. But I, I just want the, the, the problem with waiting and I'll say this and I should have said it before. The problem with waiting until it's clear to everybody that this is fine. This is economically unsustainable is when it's clear to everybody we're already in a depression and it's too late. That's what they don't get. All right, more roll call here with uh, Katie kicking us off. Hey, Buck, I totally agree with you. When they said flatten the curve, I knew it would also widen the curve. This might keep facilities from being too crowded, but it never guarantees that people will not get the virus eventually. I don't understand the long-term goal or plan. Yeah, this is the concern that a lot of us have. If they, I mean, yeah, okay, I understand. If you overwhelm the health facilities, you'll have people dying in larger numbers because they can't get any care. Fine. So that's why I've said 15 days, I, I get it, but... We also need to understand that there is no total safety from this virus if we're interacting in society at all. And it's not possible to have no interaction in society and maintain our, you know, our economic people. I, I say economic system, and, and there's this tendency to think stock market, 401k. This is what the libs keep yelling. You know, you know people that are rich want to stay. The really rich people have already gone to their private islands and they've already gone to their you know, you know, their hideaways and they've stacked up enough food and they don't care at all. So this is the people that get hurt by a shutdown economy are not rich people. This, this is a lie. This is what everyone needs to remember. It's the, the people that are worth 50, 100 million, a billion, 10 billion, whatever it may be. People who are actually rich, not people who make one hundred thousand dollars a year. They're not rich. The people who are actually rich are going to be fine economically, assuming the dollar doesn't collapse and there's not a complete reset of the economy that way. The people that are hurt are working people, those who are working paycheck to paycheck and you know need the money in an immediate sense. Shutting down the economy is crushing them. It's not crushing, you know, lib journos who work for the Washington Post or the New York Times. They're working from home. They're just, you know, typing away in their computers, drinking soy lattes, talking about how evil anybody is that wants to avoid a depression, right? I mean, that's, they're fine with it. Yeah, I wonder what their attitude will be like when they go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods and all of a sudden, not only is there no, you know, green tea matcha powder on the shelves, there's no milk, there's no bread, there's no food, really. Now, you could say, Buck, that won't happen. Oh, yeah? What, what, what goes on if, if all of a sudden we have this continuation here and you have, a true financial crisis, a credit crisis? What happens if inflation kicks in? D does anyone think that the countries that have gone through economic nightmares were like, yeah, let's, go, let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. No, it happened to them because of decisions that were made, and once they realized that it was too late. But I don't know. Once I hear this right now, no, we'll just, we'll just all say lockdown. For, we'll all say lockdown for a year. What, what could happen? We don't need to worry about anything. We'll just stay locked down for a year. This is this is kind of the left wing mentality that I'm seeing now as if that won't have catastrophic consequences to life and to health. It's not about it's not about people's stock accounts. I don't even, I don't even care about people's stock accounts. Ooh. All right. Joanne, I think we should treat the Wuhan virus and the economy the same way we were trained to do damage control in the Navy. The number one thing during a fire or flooding is to sh uh, save the ship. Of course, you try to get every sailor out of the spaces, but when it's time to dog down the hatches, it's over. Never had to experience that. Only saw it in the movies. The economy is the ship, and we need to save it. No, I mean, Joanne, this is a point of view that the people are, are expressing, taking into account that we are already losing people to this virus. We will continue to lose people from this virus. We are mitigating risks from this virus. We're, there's no zero. There's no people are not going to die if only we give up the economy. It's people are dying and how much risk are we willing to accept of additional death if we do more economic activity? I don't know. No one thinks of it this way, but that is what happens in the world all the time. That's what happens with driving. It's what happens with what pharmaceuticals you can take. It is all about balancing out risk. 
We, no one, the government does not promise anyone a zero-risk existence. Does not promise anyone zero risk to their health. It can't. And so government policy can't be made on if it saves just one life. I mean, okay, it, it would save, it would save just one life if we uh, banned all driving. It would save thousands of lives, actually, tens of thousands of lives. Does anyone want to make that case? The president said this. There's a reason he said it. And people go, oh, it's a, no, it's illustrating the point. Um, all right, team, that's uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much. for. Uh, I, I kind of went at length there. My bad. Thank you so much. Please download the podcast. Tell your friends. We'll be back here tomorrow. We're all going to be okay. Watch a movie. Listen to a good song. We here in the Freedom Hut love you. We'll be here for you every day. Shields high. <laughs>